Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns forever. And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. We're always glad to have you. You know, I never know who's watching here in the Tennessee Valley and the people, you know, it goes online and it goes around the world. So we're so grateful for this opportunity to kind of in a quiet, wonderful way, sit down and study the Bible. And I've been doing a series. Now, I promise you this morning, I'm going to wind this lesson up on prayer. I promise. I'll finish. Uh, We've talked about it four Sundays. And so I hope that like I have, I have renewed my love and appreciation and power of prayer. And I hope you have too. I've sensed it because I need it. Uh, The world needs it. The church needs it. Everybody needs it. And it's the one thing you ask, you know, do, uh, are you, how's your prayer life? Well, it's not very good. Uh, I just pray when I get in trouble. Or I prayed one time, some time ago, and it didn't, it didn't do any good, so I don't do it anymore. So th- this is such a common thing. It's such a powerful thing. It's, it's the thing that the Lord put out there first. And we kind of If we pull it in at all, it's kind of later on, you know, after everything else uh, doesn't work. Well, I'll pray about it. No, let's start out with praying because prayer is real and prayer is powerful. So we need to keep that in mind. So on this uh, first Sunday in November, and it's a wonderful time of year, I hope that all is well with you and your loved ones. I'm going to finish up this idea, but uh, I, I need to share with you some, some pictures that I received from Cuba. You know, communication, we hadn't been to Cuba in, uh, since two th- before COVID, uh, 2019. And so we have three men who are leaving this coming uh, the 10th, that's this coming Friday, I think, or Saturday. Uh, they're going there for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and kind of touch base with everybody. And I will be visiting with them as soon as they get back and find out what's going on. And, I, and everybody that I've talked to has, who has been to Cuba has talked about how horrible it is as far as a lack of food, the lack of medicine, the lack of any kind of leadership of is this ever going to end? What's going to happen? And so uh, let, me, let me share these pictures with you because this is the, some money that we sent down there for the preacher who comes to Miami once a, once a month. We send money to Emil in Miami. He buys this dried food and ships it into Cuba. This is enough food to feed 1,500 people. And that's a, a picture of the brethren in the church there at 10 October. That's the name of the congregation in Havana. And there's another picture of the food that Emil was able to obtain. If you have money, you can buy some food for a while, and then the food runs, the food runs out. And you don't know if they're ever going to. They're standing in line three days in a row. And so we're so happy that Emil can do this. And 1,500 people, that's a lot of people. And yet, uh, you know, I don't know how many meals it is. He knows what to buy because he's lived there all of his life. And he knows what to buy and he knows how to distribute it. So we need to pray, pray, pray for the situation in Cuba. And what I'm praying for is that God will intervene somehow and bring in something that will cause things to be better. That's what I pray for about Ukraine, uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine and the war in Israel and, and all that's going on in the world. I don't have an answer. That's, that's the thing about it. See, we try humanly to work things out. 
and we hit a brick wall or we hit a situation where we don't know what to do. And so if we would engage the Lord, if we would hold to His hands and ask Him to take charge, then it would be much better. I hope you have your Bible open to the 12th chapter of Acts. I hope that uh, illustration of the power of prayer will stay with you for a long time because I love to go back and read it. It's some of the humor in the Bible. It doesn't start out as humor because it starts out by talking about Herod. And, that, and at this time, I love that. At what time? A horrible time. A horrible time. It's been about eight years since stone, uh, Stephen was stoned. And so now then, he is back uh, Peter is back in a situation where he's trying to lead Peter, James, and John, trying to lead the church in Jerusalem. And it says, and about that time, Herod the king uh, laid violent hands on those who belonged to the church. And you know, you know that I, I talked about that because that means so much to me. Because who do you belong to? What do you belong to? Well, I don't. You know, mom and dad never did belong to anything. Well, it's so sad. It's so sad to spend your life not realizing that the Lord wants you in His family. It's called the church. Now, the church takes a bad rap sometimes, and some of it we bring on ourselves. But let's go back and see what the New Testament church really was, and that's what we're trying to be, whatever the New Testament church was. Not, not all of them, because there were some uh, sinful churches back then. The Corinthian, we're studying that on Sunday morning in our Sunday school class at Mayfair, the Corinthian church. And uh, it, it was full of sin. And Paul wrote the whole book of 1 Corinthians to try to get them to, uh, to repent of their sins. And they did, uh, most of them. They still lack in giving like they should have, he talks about in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. But it's, it's a fact that we, let's go back to Acts chapter 2, because that's the way the Lord set it up. That's the way it was at its birthday. That's when it was brand new, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking the bread in prayer, verse 42. Uh, and uh, the amazing things happened in the next verses, 43 to 47, that they, they sold uh, their goods and gave them, and they ate their meals in their homes, and they prayed to God, and they, and they served the Lord, and they, and, and they found favor with all the people. Now, isn't that a compliment? It, they didn't have to compromise. They didn't have to say, well, let's just don't be so, uh, let's just don't be so hard about what, let's just kind of update everything. No, leave it like it is. Don't add to or take from. Leave it like it is. And so, in verse 47, and they found favor with all the people and the Lord. That's the important thing. And the Lord added to the churches daily such as were being saved. And so then the church then was being persecuted because they belonged to the church. They belonged to Christ because Christ is the head of the church, Colossians 1, uh, chapter 1. He killed James, uh, the brother of John, with a sword. And I told you, you know, a couple of weeks ago, that's a, that to cut somebody's head off was the ultimate, uh, say, that was the ultimate death, save for, uh, you know, very powerful people. They want to make a statement, go out and hang them, that's one thing, or put them on a cross, that's common. There were crosses with people on it up and down the road in Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, and yeah, in Jerusalem and probably in, other, and in Rome too, because this was a Roman type of crucifixion. They have, they decided what the worst thing we can do, and that was to put somebody on a cross. And that's what they did to our Lord. And so then it pleased uh, the Jews that they, uh, that he killed uh, James, and so he arrested Peter. Got a problem now. Uh, it started a religious holiday. There are eight days, first day's Passover, seven days of uh, celebration and of uh, no yeast in the found in the family and in, in the home with the families because they were that was considered sin. And so then they got a hold of Peter in jail. All right. And uh, my, as you know, my favorite verse is verse uh, five. So Peter was kept in prison. Okay. He's behind. At, at least two gates and, and 16 soldiers. That's pretty much maximum security, isn't it? 
And you remember he was in there three days. This is his third trip. He probably had his own cell. I don't know. You know, they probably said, well, here comes Peter again. Put him, lock him up. Just make sure he doesn't get out. But this time he's making sure. This is when the the situation, here, here, listen to me this morning. This is when the situation looks impossible, like Cuba, <laughs> kind of like Israel and Palestine, and these situations that we see in this world and the, and the condition we're in. Do you think, again, we're getting better and better, or are we getting worse and worse as far as living like the Lord wants us to? And so then when a, when a situation gets impossible, what do you do? Well, I tell you what they did. They prayed. See, Herod can lock him up, but that's it. It's going to take the Lord to get him out. And we talked about that. And earnest prayer was made for him uh, by the church, under God, by the church. This is a prayer meeting. We used to have those. And they did a lot of good. And so we need to have more prayer meetings. Don't come to preach. Don't come to sing. Don't come to take up money. Just come to pray. Okay. And then he went on in. I'm sure I've covered this, but I, <laughs> I love it so well, so much. It's just uh, they put him in jail, and um, uh, Peter goes to sleep. And uh, the thing about it, and it says, and that very night, we're going to kill him in the morning. We're going to cut his head off in the morning. I cannot imagine that kind of pressure. I cannot imagine that kind of, of disposition. You know, what? I, well, I'm going to die in the morning. Well, dying is one thing. Being Having your head cut off is something else. But Peter's asleep. Why? Because he knew that God was in charge. Did he know they were praying with him in, the, in, the, uh, in Mary's house, as you've read with me about where they were? They were in Mary's house praying. It didn't matter. I think what Peter was saying is the same thing Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 through 9. Uh, I'm ready to go. The time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready to go. Somebody said to me the other day, and I remembered it, it's only when you're ready to go to be with the Lord, hopefully, to be with Him it's only when you're ready to go that you're ready to live. Isn't that good? I, I've just been massaging that mentally and thinking about how that, how that relieves you of all the stress and everything that goes on. It's when you're ready to go, then you're ready to live. And, and I, I've told you before, I, I have the opportunity of being with so many who are ready to go. And the beautiful thing about it is they don't have to get ready. They stay ready. And you don't see Paul, uh, Peter here saying, oh, I've got to talk to so-and-so. I've got to make this right. I've got to apologize to this person. And I've got to repay this person because I cheated them out of money. You know, he didn't have to work at getting ready to go. He stayed ready. And I hope you do, and I hope I do because that's the only hope we have. And so then he was asleep. The angel comes in, kicks him, and says, get up. Get up. We're getting out of here. Get your sandals on. Get your, I love it. Get your, clo get your, clo uh, your, your cloak on. Get your outer garment on. Wrap it around you. We're getting out of here. He passed gate number one and gate number two. What, what about the soldiers? We're going to read about what happened to them. And so they get out to the big gate that leads you out between the prison and the street. And the angel said, okay, Peter, you're on your own. Isn't it interesting that the Lord does for us only what we can't do for ourselves? And then he knows what we can do for ourselves, and he expects us to do it. That's what we need to remember about, about, about prayer. Somebody says, well, I've been praying and, uh, and I didn't get an answer. Well, you're praying for a job? Yeah. Well, uh, have you sent out resumes? Are you knocking on doors? Are you working at it? Can you do what you can do and let the Lord do what He can do? 
And somebody says, well, my, my family is a mess. Well, why don't you uh, look in the mirror and see if you're straightened out uh, biblically, and if you're doing what's right, then the Lord can work on us. See, it's all, only the Lord changes people. I've said a thousand times, I know, that, that marriage is not a rehabilitation program. Somebody says, well, I'm going to marry him, but I can change him. No, you can't. He can only change himself, and only really the Lord can change him into what he needs to be. And so then Peter says, uh, he doesn't say anything. He gets up, and he's led by the... And it, the Bible says, and when uh, he came to himself, when he got outside, and he's standing in the middle of the street, and he's just but been hours from death, and the Bible says, and he kind of waked up, and he thought he was been dreaming. But it wasn't a dream. It was real. Why are we amazed when the Lord does for us what we ask Him to do? Why are we surprised? Uh, you know, that, that's the reason we are, I guess, is because we just uh, we don't have enough trust in Him. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And so Peter gets out of jail. He tries to get in the house. Uh, he beats on the door to get into the prayer meeting. And, and uh, the little girl uh, named Rhoda comes to the door. She hears his voice. She can't believe it's he. And so he runs back. She runs back and tells the uh, crowd. And they don't believe it. They say, you're crazy. You've read all of that. But let's look at verse 18. Now when the day came. All right, it's execution day. Peter, you're going to lose your head this morning. For what? preaching, taking care of those who belong to the church. He wasn't a political, he wasn't running for an office. He wasn't, uh, you know, connected in any way with the city other than trying to get people to live right. Amen. And when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the elders over what had become a preacher, of what had become a Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries, that's so 16 soldiers, guards, and ordered them to be put to death. And when he came down from Judea, and then he, that is Peter, went down to Judea to uh, uh, Syria and spent Caesarea and spent time there. So Peter said, "I'm out of here." What happened to the soldier? Well, that was a death penalty. You remember in Acts chapter uh, 16, with the Philippian jailer was supposed to be taking care of Paul and Silas, and the earthquake came and the chains fell off their feet, and all the prisoners ran except Peter and uh, Paul and Silas, and and. Uh, he, uh, he came in, and the Bible says he was about to take his sword and kill himself. Why? That's a death penalty for the soldiers if your prisoner escaped. So these boys just lost it because God took charge of the situation. And Herod was angry. And then you need to go ahead and read that because he thinks he's God, and he looks like God. He tries to, and he acts like God, and uh, the Lord sent some worms and they devoured his body. And the word of the Lord increased and multiplied. Isn't that wonderful? And the word of the Lord increased and multiplied. Just let the Lord handle it instead of being the last resort. Now then, in the time remains, since I made you a promise and I'm going to keep it, let's talk about what happens. Let's talk about what happens when we don't sin. I wrote down some things I want you to uh, think about with me. Prayerlessness is a sin. Now that, that was uh, difficult for me to, to come to grips with. When I don't pray, I think I'm sinning. Well, we have a command, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. He commands us to pray without ceasing. He connects prayer with the most meaningful things about living the Christian life. But over in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, Samuel, that great man of God, is about to die, and he's speaking to Israel. And he says the most unusual thing in verse 23. He says, Far be it from me that I might sin against God, by not praying for you. Did you know that was in the Bible? 
Do you know that's the way God feels about us not doing what He's asked us? You know, God, God is not playing a game. He's not mincing things. He's, he's real serious, you know. God is serious about this matter of life and death and heaven and hell. You know, that's real. And so Samuel said, if I don't pray for y'all, I'm sinning. And then we have that wonderful example over in the book of Job in the first chapter where the Bible says that Job was praying for his kids, for his children, his grown children. And so then I just, I, that's the only conclusion I can come to, that when I don't pray, and there are a number of things, that pride probably is the biggest reason. I can handle it myself, Lord, leave me alone. You know, I, I, I got myself in this mess, I'll get myself out. Okay, how's that working for you? So he's, he's command. you know why? It's kind of like worry. And, and I've said all along, if worry would do any good, the Lord would have commanded it. But worry doesn't do any good. That's what he says in uh, chap Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. He said to the Gentiles, uh, or to the, to the brethren, to preparation for the church, he said, uh, why do you act like the Gentiles as far as worrying is concerned? He just told them, I consider the field, field, the flowers in the field and the birds in the heavens and, and the hair of your head a number. I am so into you. I am so aware of you. I died, for, my son died for you. Don't you think I'm going to take care of you? In verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom. Here's the answer. And it's righteousness, doing right. Not doing wrong, doing right. And all these things, what things? Food, clothing, and shelter. <laughs> What's gone up in price? Food. What's uh, out of sight? Well, clothes. What's out of sight? Rent, house payments, interest rates, making my check last as long as I can. And so he said, well, I'm worried to death about that. It doesn't do any good. You put me first, and I'll just throw those in for her. You know, that's what I call a serendipity. A serendipity is what you enjoy while looking for something else. You do what's right and let the Lord take care of the rest of it. So then, uh, prayerlessness is bound to be a sin because the Lord talked so much about it. The Lord, he was, He's our example and He expects us to do it. But then I found out that, that when we don't pray, it opens excuse me, it opens a door for other sins. In uh, Mark chapter 14, there's a very touching mo uh, scene there in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord is with hours within death, and uh, He tells his, his closest buddies, Peter, James, and John, He goes with them the first time He goes away from them and prays, and He comes back, and they're asleep. And He wakes them up. And he says, can you not watch and pray that, here's the punchline now, that you enter not into temptation. Watch what you're doing. Watch what's going on around you. What do the policemen tell us now about our safety? Be aware of your surroundings. And so that's a common uh, uh, common command, that's a common sense approach to what's going on in the world. Look about what's going on. And the Lord said, watch yourself. I imagine I can really only look out for myself. Of course, I need to be aware of others and help when I can. But the Lord said, watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. When, you, when we watch ourselves and look at the Lord and pray, just like in the Psalms, He says, thy word have I stored up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We, we take our, our day activities and we say, well, I've got a situation where I just, I just have the greatest temptations, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And the devil just won't leave me alone. Well, that's what he said in Ephesians 4 when he said uh, that we need to be careful that we not give the devil a foothold but to be careful 
and realize that he'll take it. He'll take it a little bit, but he wants a lot, and he'll end up with it if you're not careful. So then prayerlessness is a sin. Prayerlessness leads to other sins. Prayerlessness, prayerlessness kind of is a lack of love for the Lord. Why? Because I love talking with my loved ones. I love hearing from my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. Granddaddy gets upset when we don't hear from them. Why? I want to hear from them. I love them. You want to talk to the people that you love. So is a lack of prayer a lack of love? I hope. I hope that's a, not a problem, but I'm afraid it is. Not only that, but a lack of praying is a lack of trust. Not only do I have a love problem, I've let something else steal my heart, but it's also a lack of trust. Can you trust the Lord? You know, like in James chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, uh, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth all liberally and abradeth not. So then, do we trust the Lord enough to do what he says he'll do? Proverbs 3 and verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon thy own understanding. There's the problem with pride. Lord, I'm going to do it my way. I know you. this is what you said, but this is the way I'm going to do it. And so he said, uh, Lean not upon thine own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him. He is in charge. He knows best. I love him. I believe him. But prayer is hard work. And some of us, listen to me now, some of us are just too lazy to pray. Have you ever prayed all night? Have you ever had something on your heart that was so heavy that you couldn't sleep, that you didn't want to sleep, you don't want to eat, you don't want to do anything, but lock your heart up and yourself up and bring it before the Lord. He wants to hear from us. That's quite obvious. So it's hard work. And another thing is Satan will interrupt and he will cause us to not believe in what we're saying and doing. So then I've wrapped that up. I want you to be with me next week because it's beginning the holidays and I'm going to do that special on surviving the holidays. Be sure to attend uh, with me next week. Bye-bye. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is. Come, blessed be.